All right, Shalom, Ras Tefarine, Ras Yadinos Tefarine, Wendem Yadin, Inene. I am Brother Yadin of the Lanja Society of Imperial Manitou. We want to continue on in the subject matter, very important subject matter, fundamental. It's actually the cornerstone um, subject matter, and that's prayer and the power of prayer. And much has been and can be said on prayer. But what we like to do is continue with the notes that we have up here that was um, based on our teaching, the Yom Kippur teaching. As you can see, I have some notes here, and I'd like to present um, a, a better summary and contextuality to, to this important subject matter of prayer. Now let's move this over just a little bit so you can hopefully see it a little better. Now, there's certain aspects of prayer. Let's first of all go to the scriptures. Let's begin off or continue actually with um, with uh, the scriptures that we were in. And this is the connective matter, the matter concerning prayer. Now, what is prayer? Often prayer has been defined as uh, speaking to God. That's what is considered speaking to God. And in a general sense in a general way that's accurate that prayer is speaking to God but then there's a couple of um, questions that need to be asked first of all are you speaking to the true God um, what is God who is God and and that's important now many would tell you there's only one God the Bible the scriptures and true spirituality will tell you that in truth there's only one God but since we live in the world and in a in a dispensation of, of ignorance and error, one needs to study and show themselves approved. That's, that's been our, our foundational advice to all those who seek, is first of all, study and become more acquainted as a study to show thyself approved to God, a workman that needeth not be to be ashamed, rightly dividing or explaining the word of truth. This is second... Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. And our black Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMoshiach, also reminds us and advises us, he says, to, to, to the religionists and certain types of religious folks that you do err, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. So for us, as the once lost but now found data is Israel, the knowledge of the scriptures is very important to tapping in, tuning in, and accessing the true power of God. Now, prayer is a very, a very important matter. If we would take a, a look, first of all, we're going to continue with this right here, which we have on the dry erase board. But let us first look at what the early church, the early and original church, let's look, let, let's look at the foundations of, of the true church scripturally and biblically. Now, some call this the apostolic church. Here in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, verse 42, and I want you to get a little a little clip of this, where it says right here, where it says what? It says the first church. As you can see this right here, this was the first church. This is Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, verse 42. Now, here in Acts of the Apostles, Chapter two, Yehawariyat Sara Miraf Hulet Kut El Arba Hulet. Chapter two, verse forty-two says the first church. Then it gives a reference to Acts chapter four, verses thirty-two to thirty-seven. We we'll go there next. But first things first, it says, and they, the true and the early church, continued steadfastly in the apostles or the Hawariyat, the Hawariyat Timherit the Hawariyat Timaharit, or the Apostles' Doctrine. The doctrine is the teaching. Now, make a note of this, because a lot of folks will confuse you, and if you have not studied and show yourself approved to God, they'll confuse you. They'll make you think that doctrine is dogma, and dogma is doctrine. It says the Apostles' Doctrine. Doctrine means Timaharit in our language, or among the, the Jews, it, it's, the, it's the Talmud. 
You understand? Talmud basically means teaching. Now, what kind of Talmud? Is it the Jerusalem Talmud or is it the Babylonian Talmud? So there's different types of teaching, like different types of education, but education in and of itself is still the key. So the first thing that the first church, the original church, the true church, continue steadfastly in was the apostles doctrine or the apostles teaching and if you look right here you see there's a d next to it and if you look over here right in the center column it basically will say teaching so you see that right there so it explains it even right here this is why we recommend highly recommend the schofield study bible and those who you may want to download a digital copy, go to www.lojsociety.org, and there's some, there's some free materials such as the Schofield Study Bible, Reference Bible, which you can download and you can utilize. A hard copy, too, is very good, but those who are more familiar with the mobile, digital, so forth and so on, can download that from our website for free. Now, the first thing is the Apostles' Doctrine which is the apostles' teaching, the original, the true teaching, not this kind of denomination or demon nomination nowadays or that kind of demon nomination. No, we want the, the apostolic doctrine. This is the cornerstone. You don't hear many churches nowadays talk about the apostolic doctrine. They're talking about all kind of versions and perversions of Christianity, perverting the way of our black Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMoshiach. But... When we get to the word and we study and show ourselves approved, we're getting to the root of the matter. So the first thing is the teaching. Secondly, fellowship. Now, what is fellowship? Fellowship is the brotherhood, the wendamamachnet, the wendamamachnet fikr, the brotherly love of Philadelphia, which is, which is that particular church and is the particular church of the Rastafari revelation, the church of Philadelphia. And it says, and in breaking of bread. So the breaking of bread is the korban, the korban, or some say korban. Now, the korban today is an alcoholic drink. You understand? But if we put it into its proper context, we can understand how it went from the true in that day and time, the early church, to the false in this present day and time, and all as a matter of ignorance, envy, and error. Now, fourthly, is prayers. So we always used to wonder about this, like, wait, the first church had a fourfold, we could say, foundation, well, based on faith. Faith is, faith is the, the meseret. Faith is the, is the base. You understand? Is the base of the beta mekdes. Is the base of, of the holy place. Is the base. Faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Now, we, we know that from the scriptures, and we know that from, from real life and esoterically. So what is faith is also a very important subject matter. When we trace it, we find that the root of this is the Amen. Now, in ancient Egypt, the Amen was known as the hidden one because faith is not something that is seen. And it says in the scriptures that we walk by faith and not by sight. But today, in this modern seclura, many people have been mis misled or deceived into be like even that seeing is believing but why do you have to have faith in something that you already can see you can see it's there why do you have faith in it you you know it's there you, you know what i mean but anyway people don't think about that very much they hear these things and they don't study for themselves to show themselves approved so when we talk about prayer and we say prayer is a foundational. It's it's it, 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 it's very important to us individually as well as collectively. And we, as true Rastafari and Ethiopian Hebrews, have to build up our our prayer life. You understand? And recognize that importance both in the unity or atonement of the individual with the true source and the true life giver, the true God, as well as the community with one another as a corporate body, you understand, or the body of, of Christ, the body of our black Lord and Savior, which is the church. Now, beginning all things with the head, you understand, and the head now has manifested this word of life, the scriptures, as an instruction, as an instruction. So this is why we begin with this instruction as Proverbs chapter 1 verse 8 says, 
hear the instruction of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother. And the law of the mother is the Torah. Some can even trace that to ancient Egypt or Tauret, the Tauret or the Taort, the Taort. Now, that's also another very interesting subject matter. But let's continue on the subject matter of prayer, the subject matter of prayer. So here we have the first church having this, this um, the four walls, in a sense, you can say, based on the foundation of faith is the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayers. So I asked myself, why was prayers last? Because in most churches you have what's going on where people, you go to a lot of these churches and they want to pray for you, or somebody want to lay hands on you, so forth and so on. I tell my people, my brothers and sisters, be very, very careful with that. If you understand this spiritual universe that we're living in, you understand, be very, very careful for that. Because even the early church, first it was teaching. It was teaching. Before, before we can fellowship, we must be taught. You understand? We must be taught because elsewhere in the scriptures it tells us that if one does not bring this doctrine, let's understand how important the true teaching is. Let's understand how important true teaching is. Brothers and sisters, please take note of this because we might go a little bit, not fast, but at a lively pace. Um, second Epistle of John. Second Epistle of John. Not not John's Gospel, but the second epistle of John. And it's only one chapter. So the one chapter, verse 10, it says, If there come any to you and bring not this doctrine, if there's any that come to us and don't bring this teaching, the teaching of his imperial majesty, it says, Receive him not into your house. Don't receive him or her into your house. Neither bid him Godspeed. Neither bid them Shalom. Don't bid them Salam. Don't bid them hotep. Don't bid them Godspeed. Now, ones will say, well, that's not very friendly to do, but one has to understand the word. And sometimes psychic and karmic debts, even in ignorance, are built up by the misapplication or the misuse of the word. Remember, this is true Christina, true Christianity. Therefore, it's not just physical. You understand, even though the physical truth of the seed, we as the black people and our black Lord and Savior must be recognized. You must accept that Christ came in the flesh of the black man, period. That's the truth right there. You cannot get around that. But the real point of that incarnation and manifestation was to restore this universe or this part of the universe to spiritual equilibrium, equilibrium or that balance again, or metaphysically, you understand, from that spiritual fall. So here it says that neither bid him God speak. Why? Look at verse 11. Verse 11 says, For he that bid of him God speed, and when you look in the language, it's salam, or it's shalom. He that bids this one shalom or salam is a partaker of his evil deeds. No doubt you recall there was a video series where we, we dealt with um, shalom or peace. We spoke on peace and, and, and the, the tripartite application of peace. And we've also touched on this particular word, too, because it's very important that one does not have to be a, a polite person. You don't have to bid everybody, and you should not bid everybody shalom. You should not bid everybody peace. In other words, there's a certain, remember, it's a holy, it's a holy, a set-apart thing. In other words, do not give that which is holy to dogs. Now, if you do that in ignorance, there will be some effect, but the Almighty may have mercy on you. But then if you're warned and you continue in disobedience or rebellion, then one now has to face the full brunt of their karmic debt. In other words, we are not to bid everyone shalom or salam who doesn't come bringing the true doctrine. You see, the, 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 the true doctrine. And we find that when we look at, Acts of the Apostles again, 2 and 42. And let's put this up here because this is the foundation. Let's, let's put Acts 2, 42. 2, because it lays out four, four, four main um, subject matters. It lays out for us, first of all, it lays out the Apostles' doctrine, teaching is first. Secondly, it lays out fellowship. This means that 
we can only fellow with those who are our spiritual brothers and sisters who have heard the instruction of the Father and have not forsaken the law of the mother, which elsewhere is called our schoolmaster, where it says the law is our schoolmaster until Christos or the Moshiach, until that Christ consciousness has come. So the law is our schoolmaster. So the instruction of the father, you understand, and the law of the mother. Spiritually speaking, our father and mother. This is why Christ says, who is my brother? Who is my mother or sister? He who seeks or she who seeks to do the will of my father. And the will of the, the father is the instruction. And the father says, forsake not the law, and the law is of the mother. So here is the crux of the spiritual fellowship. So who is my brother? Or every black man is my brother. That's what many of us believe. But now as we walk in the teaching of his imperial majesty, we know it is not true. You understand? In the spiritual and in the true, in the highest sense. In the lower sense, yes. You understand? But we have to prepare and we have to be ready to deal with the spiritual warfare. And the spiritual warfare does not tell us to go after enemies in high and low places as a lot of uh, mixed up rosters have been telling each other going away from the word. I'm sure you've heard this before in high and low places. And I'm surprised that ones and ones that will hear this in a song or hear reggae artists say this and continue with it while the word says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So spiritual wickedness in high places, not in low places. So we have to be in the proper order because our Father is not the author of chaos or confusion. Now, with that being said, the third subject matter is the breaking of bread. Now, the breaking of bread in this, in this time, first of all, in that time, the breaking of bread was actually the Eucharist, was the bread and the wine, the bread and the wine. Now, Christ said that this will be renewed. Some see this in the lamb's bread, or some see this in the, in the like the ital sup of the original Rastafari, where they would yuka you to have food, some some ital food and herb, and you know, and and they would eat together in that same sense of the early Christians, what they call it an agape, an agape or the love fest, which comprise a meal, a meal. You understand? A meal, and, and there the bread and the wine, the Eucharist, the elements of the Eucharist was shared. That is the breaking of bread. That's the sense of the breaking of bread. But in this present Rastafari revelation, we even extend that to even the, the breaking of herb, the breaking of the herbal or the spiritual bread. That if one are not into the doctrine, the teaching of his majesty, and therefore the true fellowship, that means that we can't be fellowshipping with ones, even if they're dreadlock or rasta, and they're not in the teaching of his majesty. You see, we have to be separate. We have to be yet to from that. And therefore, how, how be it with breaking bread, you understand with them. You know, sometimes we'll say, yeah, I like to, I'll burn a little herb with this one and that, so forth and so on, just to kind of like, to do what? You understand, to lower the integrity of what you're supp supposed to be representing. If anything, deal with the teaching so you can deal with the fellowship. So then, then the breaking of the bread will be in proper order. Now, at the fourth, the fourth subject matter is and in prayers. I said, no wonder it did not put prayers first. Because, see, a lot of folks are out there praying. I mean, you remember as a child growing up in a so-called church, right, that we were told, okay, everybody get on your knees and, and pray. You know, you get on your knees and you like you, you look around, see what other people. And it's strange because besides maybe going to the Lord's Prayer, you know, well, teach us how to pray as John taught the disciple, our Father who art in heaven, or that type of effect, all right? So once you go, okay, and they say, well, you know what to pray. So you keep repeating our Father who art in heaven, and you keep going through that. But you're like, is this prayer? You understand? In other words, one's not even taught what prayer is. And this is one reason why this particular subject matter on prayer has been on my heart because it's easy to say, well, brothers and sisters, go pray. Maybe ones don't know enough to even ask the right question like, what is prayer? What is prayer? And this is what this particular series endeavors to 
to to teach and to discuss and hopefully to illuminate and bring this out, bring this light, in other words, out of the darkness or out of the confusion, what prayer is. But the first thing to recognize is that in the order of the true church, prayer is the, the fourth matter that's dealt with. In the true church, the first matter is faith. The second matter is the apostles or the true teaching, the apostles' doctrine. The third matter is fellowship, which is brotherhood, and consequently sisterhood, right, as well as motherhood. And then the fourth aspect is the breaking of bread, and the breaking of bread even for us is the lamb's bread. And then the fifth matter is prayer. The fifth, see, once you go through the proper order of things, then nobody has to ask, well, what is prayer or, or, or how to pray. You know what I'm saying? So this is very important. We had to put this up here in this in this metaphysical, Rastafari metaphysical or metaphysics of prayer because we don't understand that we cannot access that, that birthright. It's really our birthright. You know what I'm saying? Since man was made in the image and after the likeness, but being descended into this world or de-evolved, deviled or devolved into this world, there's a lot of lies and deception and misdirection out there. This is why the word says study and show thyself approved. You understand? Now, with that being said, let us get to the next the next quote and the next scripture in, in our notes. And in our notes, let's touch on um the first Timothy chapter two. No doubt you recall during the Yom Kippur um season um that just passed is twenty eleven we touched on 1 Timothy chapter 2, where it touches on prayer and the divine order of the sexes. And we call this a restoration or renewal of the divine nature of the Beta Israel, of the black, the once lost but now found black sheep of the family, if we can understand the importance of atonement. And this is also another subject matter that Yah Willen will touch on. The word atonement, interestingly enough, is not a direct translation of Yom Kippur. I, I believe we touched on that. But actually, what we did not recognize fully at first, but do now, is that atonement is not even an English word. It's an Egyptian word. And we're going to touch on exactly what atonement actually means. Now, along with that, the word prayer in Amharic is salot. In the Ethiopic, is salot in the first language is salot that the verb to pray is salaya and then we start to look at this word and then look up all the etymology but you know if you can't find it in the ethiopic you really can't expect to find it in the hebrew because most of the modern hebrew has become since uh what's his name um um, Yehuda, Yehuda is his name, Ben Levi, Ben Yehuda, ben Yehuda I think, was the modern, um, the modern Jew that actually helped to bring Hebrew back into fashion or being spoken. Hebrew was considered a dead language up until the 1940s and 50s with, I think, either Ben Levi or Ben Yehuda, who basically was a European Jew who said he wanted to restore Hebrew. But then in a lot of their their restoration process, they had to rely on the Ethiopic, you understand what they call another dead language, but it's a living, it has a living context. So in order for them to understand the biblical Hebrew, they had to go to the true first language, which is the Ethiopic or the Gutis. But if you can't find the meaning in the Gutis, where do we go from, from there? Well, a very important key to this particular word and that is elot, and that is prayer, is found through the hieroglyphs and is found encoded in the word pictures of ancient Egypt. And then it began to really put into context this, this word, elot, that most people will translate just as prayer. But then if you ask, well, what is prayer? The best answers you might get would be speaking to God, communicating to God, People tend to deceive people and deceive themselves when they say that prayer is worship. No, worship is not prayer. Worship is something that goes on in prayer. Worship is something that goes on even outside of prayer. 
You can worship throughout your way of living because worship shows what the worth is or the worship of the God or the true God that you serve. Worship is really about what it is worth. And interestingly enough, even in the Ethiopic, when we get to the word for worship, which is actually amelico, the word for prostration, which usually is called prayer, is um, sigid or sigid. You understand that's mesquid or a, pra- a place of prostration or segede, mesked, which means to bow down, to prostrate, which is actually one of the outer acts that are done in prayer. But that is looking at prayer exoterically. We bow down in prayer or fall on your face. That's the exoteric. The esoteric aspect is that you bow down, you humble your ego, you humble your, your, um, your self or your conception of self, recognizing the true God or the true life giver. You understand? Unfortunately, the whole act of prostration or bowing down has also been referred to the lesser, to human beings and to idols, to man-made things. People bow down and say, oh, this thing I made is my God. And that really shows a loss of the inner sense. In other words, they, they forgot that the Almighty, if he is to be found, must be found within you and not outside. You understand? Must be found in the Bible throughout. It confirms that. It says that the truth of God is written even on our hearts. But we tend to put a lot of idols also in our heart or our consciousness. So we kind of bury that truth. But that truth is the very foundation. You understand? The life giver is to be found in us and not outside. You know, when you see people praying and they like are looking up at the sky, they, they believe either God is out there in the clouds somewhere or they're looking at a, a, a picture that somebody made and they're praying to the picture. You understand? The reason why in ancient times people closed their eyes when they prayed was so that they can look within, so that they can find God in that life that they are using to even communicate with God because he is the root of their life. He is the true life. He is the life giver. But it became easy for human beings to gravitate to esoteric things or outer things so the names of the true was applied to the false. So these are all important aspects concerning prayer, you understand, that are very, very important, you understand, because if we say, well, what does prayer mean, you understand, prayer is not only an act, but prayer is in itself a rite and a ritual. Prayer, prayer contains actually many of these acts such as intercession or giving of thanks, but the main one that it contains is supplications. Supplications. Now, let us get to our notes right here, hopefully so we can at least lay a good foundation for this. In 1 Timothy, so we're going to move to the next quote, 1 Timothy First Timothy um, chapter 2, verses um, 1 and 2. So let's go to first, first Tim chapter 2, verses 1 to 2. All right, First Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 2. And here it says, I exhort, therefore, that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we, I and I, may lead a quiet and a peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Now, we touched on this already, but just to go over it again, godliness, from our Ethiopic perspective, godliness is resembling God is resembling God. Of course, some people will tell you, well, no, nobody can resemble God. That's because they have an idol in their mind. They're saying that nobody can look at that particular idol that they believe is God. But according to God's word, God is a spirit. You understand? And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Therefore, God is that spirit that is both the spirit of truth. 
he is that spirit of truth, the, the true spirit, you understand, as well as the life giver and our very